just uh, welcome everyone to this event at the Freedom of Expression Foundation. Um, so it's a hybrid uh, event with uh, Mark Seeley here on, on the computer. Um, so we're very honored to have Mark here with us, a uh, very formidable uh, voice in photography, uh, curator, historian, uh, writer, lecturer, with a long history of exploring photography's relationship to identity, race, social justice, uh, social change, uh, based in London. You have to correct me with, if I'm uh, wrong about anything here. Uh, but um, uh, and, uh, Mark wears uh, many hats, um, uh, among them um, um, decades-long um, uh, director of uh, Autograph in London. The Association of Black Photographers, which is not what came up on the screen here, which was very disappointing. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. So there you go. <laughs> Here's our first technical glitch. So, so um, there we go. Autograph, um, and also been involved in a multitude of other uh, projects relevant to um, tonight's discussion. Uh, Mark's the author of uh, this book, Decolonizing the Camera, Photography in Racial Time, uh, and um, for example has been involved with uh, Magnum uh, in a project uh, going back into the um, uh, decades-long um, archive of Magnum, uh, looking at the representation of Africa and uh, trying to look at that with fresh eyes, what's there, what is not there. Um, Mark has uh, co-edited and curated a book and exhibition, uh, African Cosmologies, and a lot of other things. Uh, so it's a great honor um, to have you here, Mark. Um, you're known as an unafraid and uh, bold critic and, and sort of thinker about photography, so so your thoughts are, are very, very welcome here. Also, we'll have uh, four photographers from the current wave of uh, Norwegian Journal of Photography. Um, I thought all were living in Norway up until uh, a few minutes ago, uh, where I realized that Nora Savosnik uh, is basically based between New York and, and Paris. Uh, we have Brian Olguin uh, living here in Oslo. And we have uh, Javad Parsa, uh, originally from Iran, and Sofia Amalia Klogart, who has uh, joined us here in Norway from Denmark. So what we'll do is first, me and Mark will have a little conversation uh, about general issues. Um, and then the four photographers will show uh, excerpts of their works, current uh, works in progress. And uh, then we'll gather for a, a conversation all among us. All right, good. Uh, so Mark, um, I mean, I have a million questions I would have loved to uh, ask you. Uh, we have to start somewhere. So I thought maybe we can start at sort of a, a sort of common, common denominator among us, uh, Magnum and your work with, with Magnum and, and, and your work going through the archive where um, you dug into the sort of uh, our representation of of Africa through the decades, going back to the, the 40s, etc. And, and you wrote one thing um, about this. You, you said, it's interesting that if this is a snapshot of the world's photographic archives in terms of trying to find a positive image of the continent, then there's not that much there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to, to, to hear more about what, uh, what, 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 what you found and, and what you didn't find. That's a good question. Well, yeah. <clears throat> um, I guess most things are, um, I mean, that's a provocation, a kind of statement like that. It's the idea that there are, you know, archives are really important, um, not just because of what's in them, because of what's not in them. And also because of what they tell us now, especially the older archives about the way people were thinking about what was important to photograph and how it was how it was photographed in every context or what was what was important to be collected and what was important to be left out and i think um tragically 
you know, the archives that I've spent time in, whether it's Getty, whether it's uh, Blackstar, up at Ryerson, or whether, or whether it's Magnum, or whether they're smaller archives, it seems to me that the overwhelming uh, focus is one that brings out, if you like, the, the, more, the, the more debasing aspects of how the human subject is framed, especially around the African content. By that, I mean there's a disproportionate focus on conflict, there's a disproportionate focus on exoticization, there's a disproportionate focus on the things that are broken around you know, the African story. And by that, I mean the African kind of diasporic story as well, if you look at it in the wider context of, say, you know, black life globally, if you like, whether it's in Brazil or whether it's in, you know, the, con the, the continent itself. So that, for me, has been, you know, um, you, you know, the question is, how does that come about? And I would argue that it comes about because of those that are looking for that story. It's like, why are you there? What are you doing there? You know, what, what, is, it, what is it that generates your interest? So there's that, you know, and, and, if, and if we don't have a wider kind of generator of interest in there, then it's not surprising that those stories or, the, or those features or those images or those single moments are the ones that, you know, become the way that the continent has been narrated. And obviously then, if the continent has been narrated in that way by essentially really important global archives, which have very few indigenous African voices within them, then there's something wrong there. It would seem to be pretty logical that something is not, something that's, that, that doesn't feel right. <laughs> not only does it not feel right, I would argue that it, it's, it's, it's not rocket science to, to see that, really. Sure. <laughs> but, but I think also if, you look, also, if you look back, you know, the language in the archives, the, the way that images have been, you know, put together, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, that kind of colonial mindset. And it's interesting, it, it's interesting, the colonial mindset, because often people don't even know they're in it, and we're all in it in, in many ways. And it's like an ongoing project to kind of decolonize all aspects of our, of our, of our lives. But that colonial mindset is one that people are just take, take as the kind of normal way of being if, if we don't stop to think. And I think that's really important part. It's like, how do we stop and think differently about representational politics? So, I mean, I, I think now in the whole industry, there is a, a time now when, when, when a lot of people are thinking about these issues. Uh, I know for sure in, in Magnum, we are having these discussions every day. But, you know, you, you've written something that I think sort of in many ways I can, can be quite uh, uh, sort of stinging to, to, to uh, a lot of uh, Magnum photographers historically, but I think sort of documentary photographers, uh, photojournalists in general, um, all over the place, um, wh where you've said this sort of, you charge that photography has not delivered its promise for real understanding or greater empathy for a majority of the world's population. Uh, and, yeah. and I think that's sort of really, uh, um, uh, it's, it's quite a, a, a scathing uh, um, uh, comment where a lot of uh, documentary photographers sort of from their earliest days has this sort of, um, uh, narrative uh, of sort of I go forth into the world I document therefore I create awareness and, and that sort of goodness and I'm part of a positive change just by going out there and, and doing my thing um, you don't buy it I buy some of it of course I mean uh, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't I'm not I'm not saying that uh, look there's a big difference between the intention and then the final result and I think, you know, there's, there's, it, it's great to have, you know, a humanitarian soul and a camera and to try and do, you know, positive things around, you know, changing our understanding of the world. But I often think what, gets, what happens in that moment is the thing outside the frame, which is what I'm talking about a lot of, in, in this current kind of like moment. It's like, yes, you can frame this stuff, but unless we really understand the politics of what's at play, behind the image itself or outside of the image itself, then the danger is, is that we end up replicating the thing that we're trying to actually, you know, problematize or bring to light. 
So if the only way that we can discuss if, if you know, famine in East Africa is through emaciated children, then there seems to be, you know, there, there seems to be a lacking there because what we need to do is to understand the geopolitics of what's at stake as to why these things happen. And a single image, if you like, or a few single images and a bit of text around, oh, there are all these people starving because, you know, they can't cope or the, the, the it's like we need to know the bigger picture. And I think what I'm asking for is a bit more forensic work to happen in, in that way. And also, really, you know, do we need to, do we, do we often need to see that to understand that in that way? You know, do we need to represent the, the African subject in such, you know, in devastating terms for us to understand the tragedy of what it means to be, you know, to be caught on the edge of life? And it seems to me that there's a fascination when I look into the archive, especially through places like Magnum and other, and I think that there's a fascination to get as close to people who are on the edge of life as possible. For, and I'm not sure whether that feels as if the democratic promise of photography is being delivered, or if you like the humanitarian aspect of photography is being delivered. So that's what I guess I'm talking about, how it kind of fails us. Because I guess what I, what I was hoping for post-World War II is that there would be a kind of greater closing, closeness of people. You know, the, the disasters of World War II had happened. We understood the, 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 the tragedy of fascism and how that impacted on the globe. And it seemed to me that, you know, we, we reverted very quickly back to that old colonial kind of mindset where we, we missed an opportunity to rebuild the world and close the gap across all those differences and I guess if we, uh, and I guess if, we, if the archive gives us the opportunity to see what photographers did, it seemed to push people away rather than bring people closer together. It seemed to fundamentally undermine, underline rather, the idea that there's them over there and us here, right? But 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 do you see any evolution in in, in time on this issue? I mean, I I, I assume sort of the the. Um, Sorry, did you not hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Yeah, 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 perfect. Um, has there been any evolution on this question? I mean, in the last, uh, I assume there has been some evolution since the, the 40s on this uh, front, since there was. I think, of war. course, of course, there's been some stories, but the, I'm, I'm looking at the overall. I mean, I think artists like Fazil Sheikh have done fantastic work around, you know, rep representing people in refugee camps, for example. I mean, I think, I think artists like Dao Bey have done fantastic jobs representing you know you know black communities and talking about you know lives from people who are seen as you know other in that sense but within the art within within the within the overall body politic if you like of photography they're exceptions rather than the rule and i'm not sure whether people think hard enough as they step into these zones of conflict or these zones of disaster whether they really do value hum, hum, human life i mean there are far too many instances of you know people moving dead bodies around in Africa to construct pictures. There's far too many undercurrent stories which are not shared around how things, how things get rendered. There are far too many, you know, you just have to hang out in a, in a, in a photo festival, say, well, the, which will remain nameless to hear people, people talking about their subjects. And, and I've sat there and heard this stuff about, you know, debasing language about people who are on the one hand saying, here's a, Here's, here's my wonderful story about this, but they're talking about the subjects in, in, in incredible un, <laughs> unempathetic terms. So I think, unfortunately, within photojournalism, there is a macho undercurrent, which is which is which is undermined the, the the good work that it could do. And I think that's that that's pretty self-evident when that macho undercurrent is is all about you know, getting close to the action. If you look at the language around it all, you know, shooting, you know, you know what I mean? It's all this very, very gun ho stuff. And, uh, and I, although I applaud people who go to war, I think there are ways of doing and making images which are, 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 are you know, can help us understand just a little bit better. I mean, I find it interesting, this idea that, um... I mean, you know, why, why it persists to be this way. I mean, there's the individual level, I guess, of, of uh, individual photographers sort of taking responsibility for how they look at their subject, subjects, uh, which subjects they pursue, 
um, which subjects they pitch, uh, which stories they sort of uh, pursue and, and try to tell. And then there's the sort of the business aspect of the, 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 the magazines, the media, the newspapers, the, the commissioners uh, of this. And, and the sort of uh, ingrained systems. I mean, I, I think you've uh, at one point you have said something like you you fear that this the whole structures uh, around this are so ingrained that it, it might be. Uh, I think it's your words uh, impossible to change. I mean, it, 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 it's that 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 seems a very uh, uh, doomsday uh, approach. Well, again, 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 that's a kind of provocation, really. It, it might be impossible to change. It might be that that's, it might, you know, ch change can either happen very quickly or can happen very slowly, depends on what the dynamics of the, of, of the theatre of play are. I think, you know, I think what is photography? So it's 1839 and we're in the year 2020. It might be that we need as much time to reset the archive back to offer some kind of, we, we might need nearly, you know, 180 years of work to reset the archive. I mean, I don't think we can turn back the tide by simply doing a kind of King Canute sitting there and saying enough already. I think, and, and also one of the things I'm very aware of when I talk about photography and time and race is that we're not all in the same place at the same time. The politics of race that happen in, the politics of the conversations around race that happen in North America in terms of photography and representation are very different from the conversations that happen in Europe, for example. And they're very different from the conversations that are happening in France and in, say, Belgium, because they all have different kind of colonialities at work. They're not the same. So the idea of something just being able to be stopped and then reset is not necessarily that easy to do because there's a different dial for each situation. So it's about getting these different frequencies to kind of line up. So if photography is a kind of sound, it needs to, start, needs to start sounding very differently. It needs to start thinking differently. And of course, it needs to join up some of the dots that have been happening you know, um, earlier on in terms of you know, the work. For example, I'd say one of the big reset buttons in terms of photography was the first Bamako Biennale in Mali. I thought that was an amazing moment. I thought another reset button for photography was when you know, the French cultural institutions were supporting Revue Noir. I thought, you know, I, I could argue that one of the reset buttons in terms of the UK was when, you know, the British cultural, you know, funding system decided to fund Autograph in 1988. Small buttons, but important, in, important dials that we can begin to tweak now so that we can begin to at least argue or have a conversation about the meaning of images rather than assume that the kind of, you know, the, the, normal, the normal way of rendering the world i.e. those that seem to have access to the medium and disseminate an image that they feel comfortable with is the best way to go forward within that conversation. And clearly that hasn't served as well. It hasn't served as well because we're still in a place where, you know, the, 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 we're, we live in an increasingly polarised world. So, in your view, um, I mean, I assume... Uh, in one sense, uh, another reset the button uh, has been or should have been, depending on uh, how you think about it, the whole digital uh, revolution in the sense that uh, you, if you go back to sort of Life magazine days, you know, you had one entry point to, to, to um, for visuals, it was through the editor at, uh, at these sort of huge institutions and now Supposedly, we're, we've all been uh, liberated from that, uh, and um, and uh, you know everyone's talking about the sort of democratization of of, of, of of media and how everyone can self-publish and get their work out there and their view and it's sort of become much more plur pluralistic, but uh, but uh, I get the sense that that <laughs> that doesn't make you jump up and down. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you can see more, and it's great that people are empowered by that. But, you know, there are, you know, there are, I mean, I think the economy of survival in doing that is, is re, I'm not, the, the question is, how does that impact on the economy of one's, of one's survival? There comes a point where, you know, is the work been purchased? Is the work been reviewed? Is it been circulated? Is it been championed? I think the DIY thing, you can only possibly, possibly only take so far. And there are only a few exceptions that get through the rule. 
But I would argue, for example, the success of, say, Zanelli Mahouli as a contemporary visual artist is, is very reliant on the relationship that she has with, that they have with um, Michael Stevenson. So, the, you know, it's about, it's about the industry machine getting behind you as well as your capacity to, you know, deliver your single project. Are you included in the conversation? Are you included in the big shows? Is your work reviewed? And I think that's really hard. And that means that you need cultural advocates like, you know, Azu at Photo Lagos, you needed BC Silver, you needed Ukuyon Weasel, you needed these agencies, if you like, or these galleries on a commercial side to, to, to push the work through. And that's been, that, that's difficult. That's really difficult. It's interesting, isn't it, that it's the Gordon Parks Foundation, if we're going to look at docu documentary photography that has, over, say, the last 10, 15 years, been really pushing Gordon's work forward now to the point where lots of people are still discovering Gordon Parks, right? But if Gordon hadn't been so successful and thought about his future vision, then maybe that hadn't have happened. Um, James Van Der Zee, another great African-American photographer, people are still virtually discovering James's work as well. And it's interesting that it's not that long ago when artists like this within the history of photography were simply written out of that. They weren't included. They, of course, had their own separate publications, but they weren't included in the grander narratives of things. And I think that's part of the reset work that's going on. It's like, how do we really understand the history of photography if it becomes like a vein, a single vein that has been mined all the time, where really there's a huge seam of really interesting work if we open the door and if we encourage ourselves to think differently about how we read, say, contemporary African photographic images in that sense, or contemporary Indian photographic images, or contemporary Chinese ways of seeing. Because the model really has been in the past, if you want to be successful, you replicate that Eurocentric way of being. So, I mean, I mean, in terms of what you just said, I mean, you know, replicating the Eurocentric sort of uh, vision, <clears throat> which, which is, I mean, th that's something that, that, that's interesting, I think, because you have um, sort of the, 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 the gold standards of, of what sort of good photography supposedly looks like, <laughs> traditionally speaking, I'm not saying that's what it is, but sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of aesthetics of it, the, uh, the format of delivery, everything, it sort of, um, it has uh, in a way changed very little in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, yeah, that, that, I agree, I think that, that's part of the problem, which is where you end up with people like, you know, Omar Victor Diop, you know, um, an artist that I've worked with wrote to me, Fanny Kildi, who's on the cover of the book. I mean, I think that they are influenced by very different visual cultures, right? I mean, if you, you, need, you need to understand that, say, someone like Rotimi Fanny Kiyori was highly tuned into the kind of spirituality of his Yoruba being. That the point of reference, unless we can do the cultural work ourselves, we'll never begin to read it fully and appreciate it fully. And it's only when there's been a kind of contemporary body of, say, African scholars that the work has been finally understood. And that's been a 30-year journey since his death to get to the point where people say, oh, finally. So therefore, without the scholarship behind that, the work would have always been left out of the, of the narrative. So that's why it's, why it's really important to have what I would call a kind of pluriversal historical reading of the work that images do in culture, right? It can't just be, everything can't just be read through the lens of a kind of mono, a mono, a mono history, if you like. We have to look at, you know, uh, we have to look at, you know, in, in the way that the, indi the way indigenous knowledges, new epistemes, if you like, can help us influence and, and create different symbolic kind of reference points that can help us access and understand different visual codes. Otherwise, it's really dry, really conservative. And it's like a workshop done from the 19, you know, 60s about what good documentary photography could be. So maybe think that, that that's what I'm, that, that's really what's exciting about really what should be exciting about that. I mean, you know, Ernest Cole's work, you know, the more I spend time looking at Ernest Cole's work, the brilliant South African photographer who left in his book, The House of Bondage, number one, is beautifully designed. Number two, it tells us so much about South Africa. And number three, it tells us a huge amount about himself and the pain and anxiety that he was going through. So it's an incredible, so it's a documentary book, but it's incredibly autobiographical at the same time. And yet it's done within a very traditional convention of black and white documentary work. But once you understand Ernest's life, 
it's not a kind of it, it's as much about the it's as much about living in a house of bondage as it is about good documentary work so it's so i just think that's just a, a really beautiful way because it's because he's close to the subject it's because he is the subject and maybe some of the things i'm asking is for people to maybe stop trying to tell somebody else's story and to get on with telling their own story and to help other people maybe tell the stories that they need to tell from the place that they are as well. Instead of this whole idea of packing your bags, getting on a plane, running outside, spending six days, doing a definitive story, coming back, definitive story, coming back, having it published and saying, aren't I great? Didn't I capture everything? The language of that is so hostile, it's unbelievable. Wouldn't it be nice to think actually, you know, if we help, if, we, if, we, if, if there are talents in these spaces, if we democratize what we've got, maybe, maybe, maybe we can get a really special understanding about what someone who has a complete empathy rather than an adopted empathy with the subject can tell us. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that, that's uh, fascinating, you know, that, that point of, of sort of, you know, what stories does one tell and, and where does one uh, sort of step away and, and let someone else uh, uh, tell that story? Um, I don't think that's, that question hasn't maybe traditionally figured so much on the uh, <laughs> photojournalist's mind <laughs> of, uh, of, uh, uh, of questions. So, I mean, I, I, and I think that that is one question that I think is very relevant also, you know, in, in, in uh, the rest of our conversation, because I think, you know, I'm interested in what is the what is the relevance of, of, of these questions here uh, for for these young uh, and uh, some young and some not so young uh, Norwegian photographers who are part of this uh, uh, program here. Um, you, you know, uh, sort of Norwegians have a a long tradition of of. Uh, a sort of uh, saying that, well, you know, we, we have never been a colonial power. We never colonized anyone. Um, and, and therefore, we are, we are uh, the odd one out. We are different. We are the nice guys, you know. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that, you know, uh, that, that's not so relevant in, in our discussion here because, you know, um, um, we are uh, part of a very sort of big international... Uh, machinery and history in terms of the photography we practice. And, 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 um, and um, I, th I think that's something we'll, we'll come back to in this conversation. I think um, as a little segue to that, we will uh, look at the works in progress that our friends here have uh, prepared, and we'll get the, the other photographers uh, up here on stage, and, and, and then we'll continue exactly with these questions. Sound about right? Perfect. Perfect. OK. So. Um, I'll leave you to it. So we'll, we'll go uh, first, um, uh, Brian, you will go first. First of all, I have to introduce myself. I'm Brian Cliff Olgin. And I also like to start by thanking the F um, Freedom of Speech Foundation, Fritur, for giving me this opportunity. And the same to NJP, Norwegian Journal of Photography. And then I shall start my presentation. Uh, the project is called Bro, so in English is English is Bro, but in Norwegian is Brud, which is a slang used by mostly young men in the eastern parts of Oslo as sort of a word for a friend or brother. But it's mostly in areas of Oslo that are known for being represented uh, when it comes to lower income and lower education, families with so lower social economical backgrounds, and many of them with immigrant backgrounds. The unemployment rate is quite high. And all this combined with a certain set of imagery that comes out of um, mostly the male uh, teenagers or young men uh, as being presented in the statistics of crime, we get a sense of a feeling that they are a bit dangerous, I guess. And this has been partly true because many of them, or well, some of them have been part of gangs, but most of them have not. So my aim here is to sort of give a nuanced imagery of who they are. And 
what I can also say immediately is that I myself, I grew up in this part of Oslo, uh, a suburb named Holmlia, and the sort of issues that I hear from the young males about being stigmatized and so on are not really new. They also existed when I was um, 16 and I started going to high school uh, at, a, at a college, uh, at a high school here in uh, Oslo, in the central parts of Oslo, where I met teenagers from other parts of the city and they wondered if I smoked weed or if I had a knife every time I went around to school. But I'm thinking that there are, so that's kind of like I'm having some sort of an insider access to some of the teenagers because of my, of my background coming from Holmlia. But at the same time, um, I'm, not, I'm not really an insider. After all, the past 10 years, uh, I've been living outside of Holmlia. Uh, I've had uh, different kinds of uh, higher education. I also lived abroad. I lived for a while in Australia. And through time, I've been accustomed to seeing them also the way the majority see the, sees them. So this, I think, it's quite interesting having this twofold uh, sort of viewpoint of them. But what I've figured out, or what I'm slowly trying to find uh, or discovering when coming back to Holmlia, is that it has some similarities to Norwegian villages or small stavit, as we call them in Norway, uh, where everyone knows each other and there's a strong sense of belonging, a strong ses sense of us. And for Holmlia and bros in Holmlia especially, there is this sense of being uh, us against the rest of the world, uh, which I find quite interesting. Um, sort of an, sort of them trying to embody a certain way of being masculine or being really tough. But at the same time, uh, even though they have a cultural background with uh, dads coming from more of a stereotypical uh, macho kind of culture, they are also part of, of this age, of this generation. So they're very interested in, in imagery themselves, but a certain sense of imagery that comes out in Instagram or other social media of themselves. So they're very self-aware at the time. And I found that a little bit difficult, to be honest, because uh, my studies are in photojournalism. And there is this sort of idea that you should be showing the world as it is, uh, and that is sort of truthful. You're a fly on the wall kind of uh, mentality. But at the same time, I'm thinking, uh, is that correct? Is that, is, am, am I doing justice to them? So that's sort of, some, sort of an, uh, a question to you, kind of, uh, Mark, that you can sort of later on try to include in the discussion. Um, I'm wondering sometimes whether it would be more interesting to, instead of being this sort of viewer, uh, letting them to use me uh, as a tool and making the imagery that they will be proud of. Because I think that might say something interesting about what they want to be. Uh, none, none of these images are what I've been thinking the last three weeks or so. This has been kind of going in my mind and thinking about. But at the same time, I think it's important that we, we also have a viewpoint a little bit from the outside. Because uh, also being coming from the inside myself and going a little bit outside, I, I hope that I tend to choose other viewpoints at the same time of, uh, of these young males. Now, I'm also having this uh, last question here, um, thinking about also how important for them is uh, the role models and how they are self-aware. But I was also wondering when, when I heard you speak to, uh, with uh, Jonas, if, yes, we have this, uh, has been this dominating imagery of uh, photojournalists mainly going out there for a six day trip and coming back with the truth. But is there a value to people coming from the outside and seeing things with fresh eyes? Is there? And what is actually, uh, in your eyes, uh, Mark, uh, as something truthful or more 
a valid sort of imagery of our world now today. And I guess that's kind of a little talk for now. Uh, many of the images here will probably be edited out eventually, but it's just a work in progress at the moment. So I hope that you sort of gotten a bit of an impression of what I've been working with lately. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, Javad will do his uh, talk in Norwegian and I will attempt to uh, simultaneously translate the whole yeah. thing. Hi Mark, see you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> jag blir inte med fotografering när jag var uh, som 18-åring. So I started photographing when I was uh, 18 years old. Och jag kom med till Tehran för att hjälpa Bin Sari i Nordiran som 19-åring. When I arrived in uh, Tehran from uh, my uh, native town of Sari in the north of Iran uh, as a 19-year-old. Uh, jag startade freelancer men fick ett övert drömmen jobben i Fars News Agency i Iranskan Stories Nyhetsbyrå. Jag reste in och utsland mot ledare och presenter. I started uh, freelancing but uh, soon enough got uh, the dream job in the Fars news agency the biggest uh, news uh, bureau of Iran. I traveled uh, both uh, domestically and internationally. I met uh, leaders and presidents. Uh, I juni 2009 efter uh, presidentval kampen Miljoner tog till gatan i nyhetsbyrå Fars uh, sa till alla fotograferna att det är inte lov att ta bilder av demonstrationen mot iranska regimen. So we jump to June 2009 after the presidential election. Uh, millions took to the streets. The news agency Fars uh, told all the photographers that it's uh, not allowed to uh, photograph demonstrations uh, uh, against the regime. Det det är farligt för fotograferna ser leder. Det så tänk kunde inte byrået hjälpa dem om de blir arresterat. Such acts would be dangerous for the photographers. The um, the uh, leadership of of the organization said. Uh, in addition, the news agency would not be able to help those who were uh, subsequently arrested. Men jag gick självklart ut på gatan och fotograferade. Det var miljoner där ute. Alla tänker att nu nu är revolution här i Iran. Jag blir inte att jobba som freelancer fotograf för det franska fotobyrå Sipapres. But I of course went uh, out on the streets to photograph. There were millions out there. Everyone was thinking, uh, now the revolution has arrived. I started uh, uh, working as a freelancer, uh, freelance photographer for the French news agency SIPA Press. Uh, and I saw a picture on Cover I Time magazine, and it was my picture. I got a little shock, but uh, it was very hygly and a for me, but samtidig a little vanskelig och trist. Här hade jag för något på time, men så kunde jag inte se det till någon bara kärsten min. One day I saw the cover of Time magazine and uh, realized that was my image. Uh, at first I was shocked, but it was of course uh, very, uh, very uh, a, bi a big thing for me. Uh, at the same time, it was difficult and uh, a sadness uh, connected to it. Uh, if I had the cover of Time magazine, I actually couldn't tell anyone, only my girlfriend. Men en dag blir alla fotograferna kallt in till ett möte med redaktören. Han sa det visste att två fotograferna sände bilder till utlande och att det fick mer pengar för detta. Jag blev väldigt rädd. Det ena var ju mig. Jag drog hem 
til kjærestene min og snakket med henne om hva jeg skulle gjøre. Jeg hadde ikke fått noen penger for jobben. But one day, all the photographers were called in to a meeting with the editor. He said they knew that two photographers were transmitting images abroad and that they were receiving a lot of money for this. Uh, I was uh, very scared because I knew one of them was me. I uh, went home to my uh, girlfriend and um, uh, spoke with her about what I were, was to do. I hadn't received any money for this job. I shop the Philippine to Ankara, Turkey, is a country that doesn't require a visa from Iran. I sought the asylum flyingers in Ankara. I bought a, uh, an airline ticket to Ankara. Uh, Turkey uh, is one of the few countries that uh, doesn't uh, demand the visas uh, for, uh, for Iranians to enter. So I went there and I applied for uh, asylum as a refugee in Ankara. In Turkey, I was able to photograph the exile Iraners. In my new life, I was able to meet many Iranians exiliranere og bestemte seg for dette prosjektet og dokumentere av deres liv. De har alle forskjellige grunner for å ha forlatt sitt moderne land, men alle jeg har snakket med håper at de en dag kunne vende tilbake til Iran. I Turkey har jeg startet fotograferet exiled Iranians. In my new life, I've uh, met uh, many Iranian exiles, uh, Iranian uh, migrants, and uh, decided that um, to document this, to document them, uh, was to be my, my big project. They all have uh, different reasons to have uh, left their uh, um, home country. But uh, everyone I talked to uh, said that they hoped that one day they would be able to return to Iran. Min fotoprojekt Exil Iranere startet i 2009. Det var en stor motivasjon for meg å vise hva som skjedde med Exil Iranere. Tusen bevis av mennesker og forlater Iran hver år. Det er blitt av en mangel på politisk, religiøs og sosial frihet i jakten på et bedre liv. Min fotografisk projekt Exil Iranere Iranians in exile started in 2009. Uh, it was a big motivation for me to show uh, what actually happens with uh, Iranian migrants. Uh, thousands of people uh, leave Iran every year, uh, driven by a lack of political, religious, and social freedom uh, and a um, uh, hunt for a, a better life. Jeg har dokumentert iranske miljø i Norge, USA, Kanada, Tyrkia, Hellas, Espanja, Sverige, Frankrike, Dubai og Israel. Dette prosjektet er mitt personlige story om eksiliranere rundt i verden. Dette er min mulighet til å leve drøm og se hver dag verden med nye øyne uten å glemme mitt hjemland. I have documented uh, Iranian uh, communities in Norway, the United States, Canada, Turkey, Greece, Spain, Sweden, France, uh, the Emirates, and Israel. Uh, this project is my personal story about exiled Iranians around the world. This is my chance to, uh, to live, to dream, and to look at the world with new eyes every day without forgetting my uh, native country. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nora. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for letting me be part of this conversation and that we're holding it here in Norway. Uh, 
My project is a photographic study of Jewish life in the Western world today and is from an insider's perspective. Uh, I've so far been photographing in America, some European countries, and Israel. Uh, the project started very much with this image. It's a self-portrait of me and my mother uh, when she was sick with cancer, and I started learning about my family history, and my uh, grandfather, Robert Savosnik, was one of 34 Norwegian Jewish Holocaust survivors. As a young girl, I tried to hide my Jewish identity by asking my mother to remove Jewish symbols. What I want to do with this project is to show people of the Norwegian audience what Jewish life can be like, as there's a, it's a very small minority. So uh, I'm going to show you through some of the images, uh, but I've been trying to focus on uh, Jews with different religious practices uh, and level of belief. Uh, this is from New York, and uh, the aim is to inspire tolerance through mirroring, and by this I mean that the readers should relate the images to their own lives. I'm also being very transparent about my own story, and similar to what Yavas has said, it's very much about my own journey within the Jewish uh, identity, I guess. And I've also included myself both in self-portrait, but also here, a family dinner, and a hybrid between the Christian traditions in Norway and the Jewish uh, traditions here, Little Christmas, where it's uh, going on Hanukkah, which is similar to Jewish Christmas. Uh, most of the pictures I'm showing is from Norway, and the focus uh, will be on Norway. Uh, here you have Nov uh, on the morning of his bar mitzvah, which is uh, similar to uh, confirmation. And the way I work is that I embed myself with the families for days, uh, trying for weeks, uh, but living with them to create trust between both of us, which is important for this project. Uh, coming from the inside of the community, I'm also very much part of the activities in contrast to talking about being the fly on the wall. This is, for example, a summer camp uh, where I'm also a leader, and the girl that's holding the light uh, is wearing my sweater because she was freezing. So I'm very much involved in the scenes. Um, so, and then to some questions I've been thinking about while working on this project, and something I found was very relevant to Mark's words, and the time we're currently in, where the trust and credibility in the media is heavily questioned. So my question, my first question, I have four questions, is, how is the credibility of my project impacted by the fact that I'm doing it as someone with an insider's perspective? The second one is, how can I, as an image maker, be more transparent towards the reader about the way I gained access and the process behind making the picture? I love the, scenar the scenery we're in here, more or less a think tank where we're discussing the process behind, but I often find it happening within niche outlets in our own industries. We do have the caption, but I don't feel that's enough. Number three. Does it add or limit to the story when I collaborate with my subjects? In my project, I'm invited into a lot of families' homes um, where they're very much in control of how they're being presented. In comparison to spot news, when you're at the scene and you leave without collaborating or asking permission. Number four is a more general one. Should we ask, because I think it's relevant to my project very much so, should we ask those who we photograph how they want to be portrayed and let them be involved in choosing what picture to be published? If so, what situation is suitable? For example, vulnerable minorities contra dictators. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Sophie Emily, and I'm a Danish photographer currently living and working in Norway. And uh, 
I traveled to Africa making pictures that seemed kind of uh, uh, yeah, interesting to uh, talk about later on. And I'm very curious to hear what you, Mark, see in my work. Um, the project is called The Modern Maasai, and it's very much in progress. The ethnic, ethnic group of Maasais are not underrepresented in the history of photography. It's rather the opposite. With their distinctive clothes and customs, they have attracted fashion photographers, anthropologists, artists, tourists, and documentarists for decades. They are often portrayed in their traditional communities in the mainland, in proximity to the major game parks of Tanzania and Kenya. They are often pictured jumping, posing with a spear, or glancing over their kettle. But the reality for the Maasai has changed, and many have had to leave this traditional semi-nomadic life to make money. They are increasingly socially and economically marginalized, vulnerable to climate changes, displacement, land grabbing, and threatened by the expansions, expansion of the ecotourism industry. I am going to show you some of my contact sheets. Um, as I am very much in progress with the edit. Um, in this project, I show the life, everyday life of East African Maasais who are fighting to preserve their cultural identities while adjusting to the norms and demands of the globalized world. As I am the, the, the final of the NJP, I have taken my liberty to read some of the texts that I am writing, and while I read them aloud, you can meditate over all these images, because I know that there are quite a lot, and I'm interested in knowing which ones you like and which ones you dislike. So um, I'm going to read aloud some text, and they are fragments I have written down, and I imagine will be a part of the final projects. They are primarily based on interviews, diary notes, and my own experiences. And within these texts that I've taken out to read aloud, I focus on the rather tragic meetings and events I have uh, experienced myself or encountered. The white woman is walking with her head facing down, looking for seashells entangled in the dark seaweed. The black man is shouting at the woman. Jumbo, what's your name? Mzungu, Hakuna Matata. Italy, Poa Poa. At first, she is flattered. Later, she is angry. She walks away with a fast pace from the stairs of the man, looking decisively at her feet. Some tourists are caught in the coral reefs. They swim too far out to see the beauty of the uh, colonies of coral polyps. The water retracts, it's suddenly that time of the day and the tourists are lost in the low tide. Their bodies get sunburned and they try to cross the newly exposed landscape of the sharp reef. When they finally get back, they have to rest. They re re withdraw from the beach they are embarrassed. They buy everything they can get a hold of to which may relieve the pain. Aloe vera leaves, cold drinks, later on a massage and entertainment. They feel stupid and helpless. On the beach, the tourists seem to forget more and more day by day. The sun is shining and the skin is changing. White, red, patterned, flakes of brown, delicate pink like a conch. They buy the most colorful things they can find, soft textiles in red, white, and purple, wristbands of pearls with their own name on, like a distant memory of themselves in a past life. On the beach, the Maasai have more than one name. If the tourists cannot pronounce it, they have to come up with a new one. 
I have met both Michael Jackson and Coca-Cola on the beach of Puani Mishingani. One Maasai has seven different wristbands on. The tourist did not pick them up before they left. These names he will not forget. A wristband is two hours of work. The shops by the shore are called Ikea, Amazon, Gucci, Tiffany, Little. They are all basically selling the same things. Ebony figures, colored pearls, scarves, key hangers. Tonight the Maasai are allowed to enter the resort to sell their goods directly to the hotel guests. The tourists are eating and the Maasai's are waiting to be let in. This is the payment for entertaining the guests by singing and dancing later in the night. He says he loves me when I say goodbye to him. He smiles and seems to know he is misusing those words. It's difficult to transport the corpse back to Maasai land from Stone Town. The girl was young and died from diarrhea. They share the expenses for the boat and the car that will carry it and to the burial site. The money comes from all over the island. Now there are around 5,000 Maasai. Their names appear in different ledges. It is dark and I walk with a headlight that I don't trip up. The ground is illuminated in a circle like the spotlight of a stage someone is waiting to enter. He says I have a place in his heart. I find it a very long way home. He tells me they cut off the skin with a knife that they will either be beaten up or expelled by the community if they cry entering their adulthood. The knife blade against the thin skin, the boy says nothing. The elders are satisfied. Now the man will never cry again. The dog follows me for two hours, looks at, looks at me as if I were its friend. I just met someone in the darkness. There is no light here on the beach except for spots of lamps radiating light from the hotels. I am touched by its faithful, faithfulness and then it's gone. Tonight I had a dream about you and me. You came back to Tanzania to visit me. You traveled between your country and mine to see me. We can have a secret between you and me. You don't have to tell your boyfriend. I never feel like this after such a short time. I have never felt like this before after meeting you yesterday. Tomorrow you come by my shop. I would like to give you something as a memory of me, nothing expensive. So I guess for me, I think there is a strength in being an outsider and trying to show it in words and pictures. But at the same time, I'm quite afraid that my work will be misused by someone who has a political agenda or who doesn't see it the same way as I do. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm very interested in knowing what you think about it and what you think I should work harder on. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, great to see. And Mark, are you uh, among us still? Ah, there you are. Um, okay, so I mean, uh, you guys are making my life very easy because you all had, or a lot of you had a lot of questions for, uh, for Mark. So I can, um, so, but, but it seems to me the common denominator here is that this thing about photographing on the inside versus the outside, what does that even mean in some cases, whether you are an insider or an outsider, um, and how to navigate all of that. I mean, I, I guess, um, I mean, fo following from the, the very last question, Mark, uh, it came up from, from uh, Sophia Harris, uh, you know, there's a strength to being the outsider perspective. Uh, when is the outsider perspective what the doctor prescribes and when is it not? Uh, 
Am I? Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, this is really, really difficult, difficult terrain. When, 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 when is one inside and when is one outside? I think what you can only. I mean, I'm also. I'm. I'm very keen on the idea of um, how we welcome the stranger and what that means to be to truly see the face of the other is an incredibly difficult thing to do. To truly bridge the kind of, you know, the gaps that we have across our human experiences is incredibly difficult to do. And I think, you know, the more, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm hugely influenced by, you know, the work of Emmanuel Levinas, a, a very kind of interesting, you know, Jewish philosopher who, who talked about the face of the other and, if the, and that we have to take responsibility for the face of the other. And until we truly see the face of the other, then we're kind of like lacking in every possible way. So the idea there is that, which I think joins much of what you all are trying to do, is to try and take some form of responsibility for the other, if you like. And I think, and, and that means whether there's a kind of, you know, a Jewish person in New York, and you happen to be Jewish in, 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 in Norway, whether that happens to be a shared experience of kind of Iranian immigration, or if you like someone who has a kind of, you know, a desire, I think is the word, to talk to, you know, a people that are on the edge of extinction, if you like. So for me, the question is, you know, how do we truly take responsibility for the other? And for me, that's a work in progress because we'll, we'll only know that when the gaps between the other and ourselves are finally closed. So in many ways, only when we become truly kind of equal in our desire to take responsibility for the other, will that gap be closed? So following on that, um, uh, Nora and uh, Sophia, uh, sort of what, what questions have you asked yourself going into your respective projects to sort of uh, try to preempt some of the pitfalls? I mean, like what are, in Nora's case, what, what are the pitfalls of being the insider too much? And in Sophia's case, what, what are your pitfalls as being the outsider? Um, I guess it's not only my pitfall, but it's also the, the, the fault of many Western viewers that we don't see the same as the people who are within the pictures. For instance, if I show pictures of where they sleep, then people from the Western world will say, Oh, that's horrible. Oh, how can she show that? And that is just, uh, um, what would you call it? This, the, the pornography of the, the tragic. Um, but then to them, that's how they always sleep. You know, they, uh, they didn't have anything in the mainland. They were used to sleeping on the ground or on self-made beds. So there is also a lack of, of what we know and what we see that it, that there is a, a gap between that that is missing. Um, and then, of course, they, the people I've portrayed, they, they want to show themselves as strong and masculine. And at the same time, that is not what I'm interested in because that's what the history of photography with the Messiahs actually has proven. They, the pictures I'm thinking about are also like pictures from female anthropologists' work in, in Africa and how they present um, native communities. And there seemed to be an almost erotic fascination of these masculine bodies that I would like to, uh, what can you tell, you know, retell that story that these bodies can also be something else, being vulnerable, and, but that's not what they're interested in showing. I don't know if that answers your question, can, but that, yeah. Can, can I just make an, an, an interjection really? I think. Yeah. The problem, the problem we have is that this is where, where it becomes really difficult to push back against the tide of images that have come out in terms of you know, representations of the Maasai. 
because in many ways, the, this is what I mean by when, when, when we're talking about the how much time it will take to undo all of those kind of stereotypical images that are in circulation. And it's really difficult to when when you when you want to do something else or you feel like you can do something else. I mean, the level of criticism that one 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 could face for that is that it simply says you know, more about you than it does about them because, you know, they, they're, not, they're not in a position to kind of like speak in that space. And it's, that, that, that's, the pro that's part of the problem. And if you begin to set yourself up as the, as, as the person that's trying to speak for them through, you know, these documentary, these moments of people lying in, through their everyday lives, or if you like a kind of poetic, almost, I, I was, I, I could, I, I think it's best to kind of be honest. I could say that what, you, you're in danger, really, of a kind of romantic space as well around the encounter. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it will be read like that. So my first impression as you were, as you were reading the work is that this is, this, this is kind of formulated out of a kind of romantic desire to try and do something else. And, I'm not, and the photographs have to be incredibly strong to pull that off or you know, things that we might not have seen before, or they have to somehow break the link. This is what I mean by delinking all of those historical representations. They have to maybe do something else. And this is what I mean by actually stepping back and saying, the critical question is, you know, what's the work the work is doing in this moment or in culture? And it's really hard to undo. It's a bit like, you know, can we possibly undo the work of pornography? I think you mentioned the word. Is it possible to have representations of the female body nude without them being pornographic in some shape or form? Because the work that pornography has done on culture means that there's always going to be a sexuality charged within the representation of that. Unless we can really do something, you know, with it to disrupt that somehow. It might be text. It might be different forms, it might be lighting, I don't really know. But it's so difficult to do that work. Because of the baggage, the historical baggage, because of this is what I mean by the colonialities of it. So you might be just climbing up this incredible slippery slope, which means that you want to get there, but unfortunately, you're carrying the weight of all of that other crap, no matter what's on there, on your backpack, and you're not going to get up the mounting of difference. Nora, what, what about the other side of the coin here? What, what, what's, uh, what, 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 what are your danger zones? Uh, right, but I want to tune it back into what you said about creating an equal space. And I think that goes into the aspect of caring. And in the moment, I believe it's possible to create it, uh, which is also what I'm trying to do. But while presenting it, I think it's impossible by having the authority of creating their narrative and having the audience that we do have in the Norwegian Journal of Photography in comparison to that one person standing in the room that can have an opinion, as I'm not letting them choose how to be portrayed, even though it's my own community. Um, for the, what, what is difficult from coming from the inside is, to, I guess, to be critical. But within the Jewish tradition in my own family, to be critical has been admired. Uh, but it's absolutely a thing to be thoughtful of when you're from the inside photographing the people you know, because you're going to meet them tomorrow, you're going to meet them a week after it's published, you're going to meet, meet them a, a year after. Um, but it's also, as we've been talking about, the history of photography has been us going there. So knowing the pitholes of it, we, I don't think we know it too well. And I think that's why we should continue exploring it. Do, do you see, I mean, like, do you always feel the insider? I mean, Brian brought that question up. I mean, like, it's kind of like we all have these concentric circles around us of, of what is us and what is our community and what we, we sort of claim to be sort of fair game in that department sort of thing. Like, I mean, you know, people say um, Jews. I mean, Jews are like super, right. super diverse crowd. It's, uh, it ranges from, you know, godless heathen me. <laughs> myself to, you know, an Orthodox Hasidic guy, you know, if I went to him and said, you know, hey, hey, my bro, you know, I'm, I'm one of you, you know, he would probably maybe not agree, you know, right. that I had any right to speak about him. I mean, like, right. in this case, how do you, do you bounce up against that question? Yeah, and I think that's a beautiful question, because I have been photographing in the Hasidic scene, and 
my, my aim with this project is to debate what is the other, because it also includes within the big Jewish community of 11 million people or probably more. Um, but I open up the conversation with them. It's also what I love about this. We're talking about the process behind it, because I started sharing my Jewish experience as the only one in my class, in a lot of the activities I did, and how in Norway there's only two, but mainly one function in synagogue, and it's orthodox. So I grew up in an orthodox shul where I had to cover up, and we split between men and women. But on the other side, I went to a secular school and grew up with secular thoughts, so I can relate to it. And that's when he started opening up his doors. And that's when he invited me into his family. Mm. Brian, can I, can, I, can I yeah, respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I looked at the portfolio that you presented, I just felt as though I wasn't really seeing you in that space. I didn't really feel, I, I think you've got great access and I didn't think it was brave enough. <laughs> I, I was, I'm always like, why? I, I, there's been some fantastic bodies of work that photograph, you know, the, the day in the life of, you know, Jewish communities. And one of my favorite photographers is a guy called Didier Ben Lulu, who uh, lives and works out of Paris. And his work in Israel is, is unbelievably strong. It's, I don't know, there's a tension within the work, which, which talks to kind of identity formations. And it's more to do with the, with the marks and the architecture the, the, the chiaroscura within the work, the light and the dark tones, the frisson prints that he uses. I mean, just, just a way of adding kind of tension. I, I think, you know, the bar mitzvah, I think the, the, the you know, the, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a place for this project, but in terms of a kind of contemporary narrative, I'm like thinking, I didn't, re I mean, there was a little girl with a jumper on, which was yours, and I appreciate you're there, and that then the intimacy is there. So I wanna, I wanna know more, actually. And I, would, and I would suggest that across all of those stories, it's like, if you're going to be in it, you know, you, you have to do the dark stuff as well as the light stuff, right? You have to give us all of the light and shade of that space. And then at that point, we might be able to edit something out of it that, that stands above the rest. So I don't, I don't and we, we want to see positive images, that's for sure. But we also want to, you know, there's gender, the gender politics in that space that you just described in that one sentence, I went to a secular school, the women were divided, I went to an orthodox space. In those three sentences, I didn't see any of that in the work. But is that, so is that, is saying, that one of the know, fault lines there? If you're gonna do a story, you're gonna fall out with people. If you're gonna do work, cultural work, you're gonna fall out with people. Even as a curator, you fall out with artists pushing people into different spaces and places, or you write about work that people disagree with. So. There's two things to do. You, you can either become a really nice person photographer and sit there and be really cozy with it all, or you can be someone who tells, you know, the story and the dark heart of human experiences is also the one that we need to see and the thing that we can hopefully bridge. I, I guess that's one of the fault lines here. Um... Which is that sort of this, this sort of, uh, that things get too cozy, like you say, that uh, it, it is easier when you are not feeling affiliated with uh, whomever it is to come at it with, uh, you know, critical gaze. But that, that's maybe what we have to take responsibility for in general, is that we have to, it's not one or the other. I mean, the challenge is to, if you are, you know, photographing your own communities or whatever, that it's not just all celebratory, you know, kumbaya all of it. Um, <laughs> uh, what about you, Brian? You, you brought this up too as, as, a, as a question mark. Uh, I mean, uh, what, 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 what benefits are you really getting from sort of your, your, your backstory having grown up in this place? I mean, like, do they see you as one of them? Uh, you, you know, you... Yeah, I understand. I think the benefits I'm getting out of it is that because I know sort of their social act and their language and their sort of behavior, kind of like being one of the guys, I'm sort of getting some, uh, some understanding and some trust that um, I won't reproduce necessarily the um, sort of um, a more um, expected imagery uh, that they have been 
brought up to believe that they are through the media, especially the news media. But you, you, you I think you said, uh, you know, you asked, uh, you know, maybe I should do it a different way. Maybe I should yeah. just be a tool uh, for, for their yeah. own image creation. Um, yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, what, what I do mean by that is that I'm a little bit divided because they're on each of their side. <laughs> and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm a little bit on between because I know how important it is for them to be seen as more than just criminals. Uh, but at the same time, I, I'm very honest with them. I, if I meet people with gangster backgrounds or so on, I will take an image. I will, I, will, I will do that kind of part of the job as well. But I find it very interesting that they're also very um, occupied with uh, images through social media and a certain way of wanting, wanting it to be portrayed. They want to be seen as tough, kind of like almost gangsterish. Uh, and uh, I don't know with their, their sense of masculinity, S but I'm not I'm not uh, embracing that necessarily because I, ha I haven't done it yet. But I, I haven't really thought about it that maybe there's a validity to that, uh, which I'm I'm kind of interested and eager to try to explore and see if they can sort of do the setup, come up, uh, come fully clothed with the sort of things they want to be portrayed with, and then just place them in the context of their neighborhood, for example. Uh, it might be, might be interesting in sort of showing that to, the twosome kind of thing that's happening there, that might be happening. Um, I, I think it's sort of like this, this question of sort of like um, um, being on the inside, you know, I, I think people often think of that in terms of, so like, oh, yeah, that means you get really good access uh, or something like that. Traditionally, sort of, in the photojournalistic macho kind of uh, swashbuckling uh, kind of milieu, that, uh, that where we are, uh, uh, everyone is scrutinizing. The, 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 uh, the normal modus operandi would be like, you know, uh, the, the best photographer is the one with the best fixer because he gets all the access. You know, that would be the how, that's how it kind of works out there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, you can say it. Horrible, but traditionally that's how it worked, right? So um, you hire the guy on the inside for money. I mean, it's brute, but that's how it worked. I think the thing that is really interesting for me about like the, the inside of you is, um, uh, is, is that it's when it gets personal that you decide to dedicate really months and years of your life doing that project. You know, kind of like that, that's the thing that sort of makes the magic. And, and, and in general, um, um, you know, it's those projects that float to the surface as, as being more profound probably than, than sort of all the assignments and the churning of the uh, same thing. Uh, now I'm starting to rant, sorry, I'm taking our time. Um, do you want to have a quick comment, uh, Mark? Be before I have one, I have one, one question for for Yava. Do you do you want to say? Yeah, something? I mean, I, I just I, I think it's it really is about what what you want what you want to say. I think as well. I mean, I think um, you know there've been some. I mean, I, I think time time spent with communities that you that you're familiar with or part of or, or come from is. I think that I think it's important to care, really important to care for the subject on, on, on every level. I think it's important to do that. I, I think um, one of the things I've said about Black British photographers is that, you know, thank God people like you know Armit Francis or Van Lee Burke or, you know, that they were there, that they cared for their communities and they created brilliant, brilliant images of the everyday moments, those kind of celebratory things which push back against the negative um, aspects of the way that the media represented, you know. Black British post World War, you know, post my, you know, post forty eight black subjects, who have been very much demonised in in the press, and I think it's important that, you, that there's a kind of archival purpose to that work, and I think if we want, if you're doing it for the long game and the long project, I, I can't help thinking, you know, like Nan Golding's projects tells us so much about life in New York and drugs now than it, that, you know, than it would have done if we were looking at them at the time of their making. You know, you know, I think we have to look at it. For the long game, I think if we're looking at Iranian migrants in, in across the world, I mean, it's a massive project. Um, you know, it's like 
it, it's going to take time for all the, for the good things that you want to see in those spaces to kind of materialize. And then, you know, the archive becomes something else, at least, at least there's a depository of kind of care, care forward images in there. And I think, you know, Brian, I think that the work on, I think young men and masculinity is a really big project. You know, the, especially, you know, all of them, white working class kids, you know, local kids. I think the question of masculinity and how we, we look at that, I think the thing to do there is to, is, to, is to try and think about the sensitive moments, the different moments. And there are, there are, there are incredibly, I mean, I grew up in a, in a, in a place of, you know, very violent, very violent young men. And it was, but there are some incredible moments of intimacy between them as well, um, which, 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 which would be wonderful to see and share. You know, I think that one of the biggest crises <laughs> that we have in the Western world is masculinity. <laughs> and if we can break that down, that would be amazing or see things differently. It would be incredible. Right. So how do we deal with all that? I think it's about an application of time. I really do think you're, you're all at the very beginning of something. And I think where, where those projects will go, you're going to need an awful lot of support and an awful lot of time before they begin to really move past the first few baby steps, if you like, of trying to do the work you're all trying to do. So I want, I want to ask you about the, um, just uh, we neglected a little bit. Uh, sort of the business parts. I, I have like three or four pages of, of questions here, but we only have five minutes left. But uh, uh, but Java, um, I'll do it first in English. Uh, you know, you you have um, an outside perspective, uh, being here also working, making your, your vocation here, even though you're you're looking at uh, this very global project of. Uh, Exiled Iranians, but what has it been like for you as someone who has come from the outside to work as a photographer here with, with the media here? I mean, has there been barriers of entry there? Uh, what's that experience been like? Um, so, I think it was not easy to as som fotograf i Norge eh, och jobbar för eh, norska aviser eller magasiner. Eh, för det, det i Iran jag har lärt eh, helt andra typer av fotografi. Jag har lärt eh, för exempel i universitetet jag har lärt helt andra eh, typer av eh, för exempel akademik det är inte sån i Norge. Och så jag kan ex, eh, exempel för exempel i Iran vi har eh, när jag varit i universitet för exempel master av optat med för exempel jenter och kvinnor inte sitter samman och spiser mat där de sitter för sig så det de var lite optat med andra ting och så eller på jobb i Iran jag husker väldigt gott det är mer sensor mer för det är inte frihet uh, vi har två forskliga typer av uh, journalist uh, i Iran. Uh, en av journalist må alltid skriva positiv om uh, iranska regimen. Okej, okay, det är säkert. Uh, du kan fortsätta jobba som fotograf eller journalist. Men om du skriver negativ om uh, regimen eller tar bilder som negativ, så du uh, mister jobb eller mister hemlande eller allt. För det jag, jag känner, jag har många vänner i Iran eh, är var på fängsel på grund av att ta en bild eh, eller fortsatt är på fängsel. Så det, det är, är inte frihet för eh, fotojournalist i Iran. Men i Norge, det är helt andra typer av fotografi. Eh, jag är fri här, jag kan ta bilder, publicera, eh, så jag kan tänka eh, vad jag ska göra. Och så det är många andra ting, så det, det var väldigt ja, viktigt för. Um, ja. but, har, har du um, um, har det varit en 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 god, god process och och få jobber uppdra? Eh, I Iran, i här. Norge, det var ja, det var väldigt det var en lång process, det var inte eh, kort. Jag huskar jag kom i Norge 2010 eller 11 och så jag är bint och jobbar som freelancer efter tre år 
Så det var veldig, det var, jeg lærte norsk, og så, og så jeg hadde jeg ikke forekort, så det må, for alle fotografer må ha forekort, så det var veldig dyrt, og for, så det var en lang prosess for den, og så, og så det, jeg tror det, på grunn av at jeg er fra utlandet, det, er stor konkurranse i Norge mellom fotografer. Så okay, jeg er fra utlandet, så jeg må ja, prøve mange ganger. Og, uh, det, det var ikke lett, men etter hvert blir det bedre og bedre. Nå tror jeg det er uh, helt ok å jobbe her som fotograf. Og det, det er mange... Ja. Uh. Har det varit intressant för dig att och lage ett projekt som handlar om norrmän eller Norge med ett blick utanför? Ja, ja, det är jag tänker alltid att lage någon projekt inte för exempel snacka om Iran eller andra typer. Så jag ska bli in Uh, nå et projekt om en uh, norsk uh, norsk så tenker det kan være helt forskjell og, ja, ja. Ja, det, uh, nei, det, det, det er jo et eksempel på jeg tror det liksom et, et, et utsideblikk hadde jo er jo interessant ikke sant? Mm. Uh, det er så mange norske fotografer som helt tiden fotograferer Norge på alle mulige måter, men det er jo ikke veldig mye av uh, utenlandske fotografer som kommer og lager langtidsprosjekter i Norge. Det er jo ikke så mye. Ja. Det er også interessant. Um, I should translate that. <laughs> I can try. <laughs> um, yeah. Should we do that in English as well? I mean, Mark, uh, now I feel bad. No, we're talking about the exclusion yeah. here. You're being excluded from our conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling terrible. No, so I, in, in short, um, I asked him about, uh, you know, the, the operating as a photographer here as an, an outsider. And, uh, and Javid said in, in the beginning, it was hard work, uh, took a long time, uh, barriers of, of, of simple logistics, of, of uh, driver licenses, and of course, language and things like that. But also that he was talking about the, the, the difference of, of, um, of, of, of the culture in which he operated in Iran, of censorship, of, of sort of uh, state-authorized journalists versus the free operators and, 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 and uh, dealing with all of that. And of course here you're free um, and, 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 and can do whatever you want, but, but that it was um, tough years in the beginning, but now it seems like you are actually uh, feeling... Uh, Positive. I asked him um, about uh, whether he would, uh, you know, has any plans to make any projects about uh, Norway or Norwegians, you know, the, the sort of outside view of, of, of this place, because we, we are not blessed by, you know, uh, lots of foreigners coming here, photographing our exotic culture, you know, um, and, and letting us see what that looks like. Um, and that is, uh, you know, something that, that uh, Javad is uh, planning as well. Uh, but of course, you have got your work cut out for you with the, the, the exile project, which uh, looks like a huge undertaking. But 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 your project, I think, is also a, an example of what I talked about. Like, okay, here it, it's a personal thing. It it really makes you for year after year pursue this project, right? And I think, um, and uh, you know, it's through the application of, of of that intensity of years that that will make uh, good results. Yeah. Jeg, jeg tenker kanskje drømmebilde for en, fordi noen ser når slutter dette projektet mm. eller men jeg ser eh, drømmebilde er eh, når jeg eh, tar en fly til eh, Iran så når det er eh, for eksempel i Teheran flyplassen, mm. det er jeg tror det er drømmebilde for så so the end, end, end state of the project, the, end, end, the, the, the moment the project is finished is when he gets on a plane to Iran and lands at Tehran airport and everything is okay. Then he can finish that project. Yeah, not free right. yet. Yeah. <laughs> when you get, come back. <laughs> Great, well, uh, it's, 
uh, horrible how fast this time has passed. Uh, and, and, and uh, curse Corona that we can't now bring you to dinner and co continue this conversation, Mark. Um, <laughs> or you could get some takeaway uh, in your house and we bring you along on the laptop, but it might not be <laughs> as good. Not ideal, but uh, no, I mean, <laughs> next great. Time. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, yeah, ne hopefully next time. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I wanted to just say something that there isn't a correct way, you know, around any of these very difficult questions, but what I'm really trying to offer up is that we just need to be a little bit more or very much more sensitive to the kinds of spaces that we occupy and, work, and the work we can do with the camera it needs to just be really, really carefully thought through going forward. And I think if we're going to try and tell other people's stories, then I think we, we really, we really need to ask ourselves, why, why are we in that position? And where is their voice within that space? Even if we, even if we are, so-called an insider it's very very it, that's that's not like a passport to do you know what you want there's still a degree of responsibility within that and i think it, it it's it, it is so complex to do that and it's not surprising that as far as a lot of the work that i'm a lot of the artists that i'm kind of working with they're, they're not necessarily working strictly within the documentary tradition, it's like an expanded narrative. Text has to play an important part. You know, the research has to play an important part. If you like, if you like, there's an opportunity for new types of anthropology, new types of investigation, new types of tools that we can apply to telling, to telling the story. And I think, um, or telling the stories. And I think it's really, re really important that we do that. But I think it's like, it's also very important that we break with tradition. I think sometimes you know, six page, double page spreads aimed at Time Life magazine are not necessarily going to give us the story in the way that it's historically been rendered. And I think the, the better the better journalists have always understood that. Always understood that. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for being you. here and having this conversation. I hope everyone will continue it in, uh, in their own way. Uh, the time ahead. Thank you.